Hello and welcome back to Rust 101. This is video 28. My name's Andy and we're going to be talking about trait objects and Rust patterns in module D. Uh, today we're going to be talking about dynamic dispatch. What is it? Why do you need it? So yeah, dynamic dispatch. Um, we're going to understand different types of dispatch and then in, later in this module, not in this video, we're going to be doing trait objects, object safety, um, some quite knotty stuff in here, difficult things. Um, but we'll go through it slowly. We'll figure it out. So today it's just going to be dynamic dispatch. So let's talk a little bit, just some introductions. So we talked about traits already, um, but we haven't talked about trait objects before. Uh, traits are a way of describing what an object can do. So they're like interfaces in other languages. You say this thing has these methods. Um, and we learned about how generics use traits. Basically, you can say uh, my function uh, can take in a thing which has this trait and then I'll generate you some code uh, for a function that takes in that exact type when you call it. And that's called monomorphization, and we'll um, go over that again. And then we'll talk about when that isn't good enough and we need to do something more dynamic. So monomorphization looks like this example. And this is actually the same example we were looking at many videos ago. So um, we're calling a function called add values, and we're calling it for different types of things. So here we're passing in an i32, and here we're passing in an f32, or rather a reference to an i32 and a reference to an f32. So how come we can call the same function with different types of argument? Well, the answer is the function has this generic parameter, t, um, and the, the two arguments are both references to t, and it also returns a t. Um, and we have this, this constraint which says t must be a my add. And my add is a trait. Uh, and we haven't described, we haven't got the trait on this slide, and we also haven't got the implementations of the fact that this trait is implemented for i32 and f32. We've just got the, the statement that i32 and f32 both implement my add, um, which means they can both be passed in as a t here, because all you have to do to be allowed to be a t here is to implement my add. And then inside we just do some stuff which is not so important, it's just stuff that's allowed by my add. So in this case, my add gives us a method called my add, or it says that we must have a method called my add. Um, okay, so this is this is how we've done stuff with generic types before, and this is how we've used traits before. We've said, um, I want this add values function to actually be able to be multiple different functions. So when I call it with an i32 here, the compiler thinks, oh, I need an add values where t is an i32, and it generates a version of add values that, own, that is exactly for i32s. And then when you call it again here, the compiler says, oh, I need one for f32s, and it generates another copy of add values which works for f32s. Um, so this has some advantages and some disadvantages. So the advantage is um, this code is super fast now because it's just like it's calling a function that is exactly for um, this type of object. So as if you'd written lots of different versions of add values for every um different type, but you didn't have to bother doing it. So it's as fast as if you'd written it manually. Um, however, um, because it's generating two copies of add values here, it's going to take twice as long to compile them. Um, and they're both going to end up as code that's inside your um, your code binary. So um, the binary will be a bit bigger. But generally, this is like a good thing to do when you can do it, because you don't waste any time. But um, that's not always possible. So let's look at, an, look at an example where we're trying to do that, but it's not going to work because it doesn't actually make sense. So we'll start off by looking at um, a couple of different types of logger struct that we're defining. We're defining a file logger, which can log stuff out into a file, presumably. And inside it, it stores the the path that we're going to write in the file, write in the file, write we're going to, the path of the file we're going to write to, um, and then we're going to implement write, which is um, a, a standard trait. So write is a trait. We're going to implement that trait for file logger. We're not telling you how. But we've also got another type of logger called a standard out logger, which doesn't use a file. It just writes to standard output. Uh, and that also is going to implement write. So this, the, these two structs both implement this trait. Uh, and then we're going to have a function which takes in one of these loggers, um, or a reference to a logger, a mutable reference, because we're going to write to it. Um, and the type of that is, it, like the type signature of this log function is going to say, you can call me uh, with any type that is write. So it all looks sensible so far, right? 
But let's look at our code. Um, we're going to read in the command line arguments and figure out what the log file is. And if we've got a log file, we're going to create a file logger. We're going to do this match statement on log file. Log file is either going to be some or none because it's an option of path buff. If, if we got given a log path, then we make a file logger. If we didn't get given a, um, a log path, we make a standard out logger. So it all looks perfectly sensible, right? We create a logger, put it into logger, and then we call log with this logger. But have you spotted the problem? Uh, well, the problem is that, well, the first way the problem manifests, which is possibly a slightly confusing way, is that the, the match statement doesn't work because we might return a file logger or a stood out logger, and those are different things. So we don't know what the type of logger is. Um, so that kind of exposes our, our problem. What's the type of something which could be a file logger or could be a stood out logger? Um, and the point is that this happens at runtime. So the compiler can't work it out because of some previous code or something and say, oh, well, um, we always actually get a file logger, so I know the type of logger. No, at runtime, we might get a file logger, we might get a stood out logger, depending on what arguments you pass into the function. So we need some kind of type that, that says logger could be either, and we haven't yet got that, uh, got to the point of being able to say that, but we will soon. All right, so let's have another look at another example. And this is like a classic um, object-oriented programming style example. So we have a trait called render, which we've defined. It has just one um, method on it called paint. And then we're going to uh, create a thing called a circle, which presumably would have some properties in it, but we haven't bothered. And we're going to create another th a struct called a rectangle, which again would have stuff in it, but we haven't defined them yet. Um, and then we want to implement um, the trait that we've defined, render, for circle. So we've implemented the paint method for circle. And we're implementing render for rectangle. We've implemented the paint method for rectangle. So these two things both implement that trait. So we want to make a collection of different shapes. So let's make a vector, create a circle, and then push that circle into that vector. Then create a rectangle, push that rectangle into that vector, and then like iterate through them and paint them all. So this looks like this would be the kind of thing you would want to do, but it doesn't work. And the reason it doesn't work is because, again, the compiler complains. It says... Um, you're trying to push a rectangle into a vec of shapes. Sorry, a, a, you're trying to push a rectangle into a vec of circles. So why is it saying that? It, this shouldn't be a vec of circles, right? It should be a vec of shape or something like that. If we look back here, we can see the first thing that we push into shapes is a circle. And a vec needs to, like everything in a vec needs to be the same type. So the compiler's gone, all right, well, they pushed a circle into this vec, so it must be a vec of circle. Then when you try and push a rectangle in, it says, hold on, that's not the right type. So we need to do something about this. We need a way of expressing it could be this or it could be this based on a trait. All right, so we, what we're going to need to do to do this is some dynamic dispatch. We're going to use a trait object. So um, a trait object is an opaque type that implements a set of traits. So basically, it's exactly what we're looking for. It's um, something which all we know about it is that it implements a trait uh, and not um, not what its concrete type is. So um, the way we say that, the way we say something is uh, uses dynamic dispatches, we say din t. And um, don't worry too much about this, but I did look up and make sure I understood what this means. Basically what this is saying is um, we don't know the size of this din t. No, 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 no. We don't know the size of this t. Uh, we know the size of the, yeah, no, sorry, we don't know the size of this din t, but we know the size of a reference to it, right? Or some other thing like a box of it or something like that. So yeah, t is a trait. And, um, yeah, in order to use these things, you have to have a pointer to them, which means you have to have a reference to a din t or a mutual reference, or it needs to be in a box or some other thing where we know we've only got a pointer to the t. We haven't got the actual t because the t itself the, the dinty is not sized or like we don't know what size it is. Um, so we can't actually kind of concretely hold on to a copy of it. We just have to hold a pointer to it where it's somewhere else in memory. Okay. So the way we would do this in that, in the example is, um, instead of holding on to a logger, which was a, a write, which doesn't quite make sense. We realize we hold on to a mutable reference to a din write. That means, um, you can't just say a mutable reference to a write. You have to put the word din here just to kind of call out to you and, and possibly to the compiler, but definitely to you to say, this is not actually a concrete thing of type write. There is no type write. There's only a trait write. Um, 
And so we've got a, a pointer, a reference, in this case a mutable reference, but it doesn't, that doesn't particularly matter for our purposes, a mutable reference to something which implements the trait right. And we're allowed to hold on to a reference because we know the size of a reference. Uh, we just don't know the size of the thing the reference is pointing to, uh, which is okay because that will be stored somewhere in, um, in some other piece of memory where we're allowed to have different size stuff. So then in order to actually like make this work, we need to return uh, in our different uh, chunks of the match a, a mutable reference to the thing we're creating, a file logger or a stdout logger. And now we've got this, this pointer type, this reference to... Uh, dynamic thing in our variable logger. So we're allowed to do that. So how does this look in memory? Um, well, with the same code as we had before, but now we're going to talk about what this ampersand din write thing looks like in memory. So basically, it's two pointers. So we, that's why I said we know the size of it. The size of it is two pointers. Um, a pointer to the actual thing. So that, that might be the file logger or the stood out logger, and it might have this data path in it. And a pointer to... Um, something called a vtable, which is basically all the methods that make sense for the type of thing it is. So this this thing here doesn't know what type the underlying thing is. It doesn't know whether it's a file logger or a stood out logger. Um, but it's okay. It knows how to call methods on them because it has this vputter, which points to a vtable, which has all the methods you might need um, to call on it. So when we call methods on it, we go through the vpointer to find the method, call the method. Uh, yeah, so there's a cost to this. Every time you call a method on this thing, which we will be doing inside log, I guess, um, you, instead of just knowing wh where the method is in memory, in, like in your um, executable, and just like the, having the code there and calling it, um, we have to go and look at this vpointer, find what memory it's pointing at, find the vtable, find the method in the vtable, um, and then and then call that method now that we know where it is. Um, so it's a little bit slower. But there are benefits as well to working this way, which is that there's no monomorphization. So there's only one copy of log created. Um, and that, that copy of log takes in uh, something that's like a, a mutual reference to a din write or something like that. Um, so your, your binary is smaller. It doesn't take you as long to compile your code. Okay, so let's fix our, our log function. So... Um, yeah, the um, so I so I was expecting the first time I read this code for this to say Amazon mute din l, which it could do, but what we're doing here is more flexible than that. We're saying it's an l, but that l must be uh, must be able to write and also um, might not be sized. So by default, if you just said l colon write like we did initially, that actually implicitly means we know the size of l. So what we're saying here is. You might not know the size of L. Um, that's what the question mark means. It means it might not be sized. We might not know the size of it. Uh, it might be dynamic dispatch. Um, and if we'd written um, just log a colon L, but we'd written this question mark size, the compiler wouldn't let us do that. But the, because we've written question mark size, we have to have a re mutable reference to L or some other type that is like a pointer type, as we were discussing before. Um, because um, a... A reference to an unsized thing is sized, so we're okay. Um, if we tried to make this code based on something that's actually potentially unsized because of the question mark sized, um, the compiler wouldn't be able to generate the code. So that's how we modify our log function. And then, um, as we talked about already, um, this the logger itself is a mutable reference to a din type. Um, and yeah, uh, uh, and that all. Oh, sorry, my um, clickiness is not working very well. Yeah, so um, basically by being flexible, we're saying you could call log with something else that was right itself, and we would generate another copy of log in that case. Um, but in this case, we're passing in um, a din right, as I showed you here. Um, so that is going to be, um, it's going to be, the, there's a, a version of log is going to be generated for a mutable reference to a din right. Um, and... It's all going to work, but we might want to... Oh, yeah, so the point, the reason why this works, the reason why logger is allowed to be passed in, even though it's not an L, so it's not right itself, it's a mutable reference to L, is that um, things like ampersand T or box of T 
or, or MSO DIN tea and box of DIN tea, actually implement T. So write t- is write is okay with saying yes. Um, this logger thing itself does implement write, even though it's a reference to an L, it still implements write. Okay, so what we might want to do, and what I quite often do, is something a bit simpler than that, which is to say, uh, make log not even take in um, a generic parameter at all, but just say it takes in a reference to something that's didn't write. So now there's definitely only one copy of log ever going to get generated, which is something that takes in a reference to a din write, as in a reference to something which implements the write trait. And then it all gets simpler because logger itself is a pointer to something that implements write, and log takes in something a pointer, something which is a pointer to uh, a thing that implements write, and we just uh, use it in there. So yeah, the previous example was more flexible. You could just say anything that might not be sized that implements write, but here we're saying exactly a reference to a thing that implements right. Um, okay, so what else? Yeah, the um, uh, the other example we had, um, we had this vec of what we were intended to be a vec of shape, um, but actually it ended up being a vec of circle because the compiler was like, well, you put a circle in it, so it must be a vec of circle. What we want to do is change that to explicitly say what type it takes. Oh, yeah, that's the best way to do it in this case, so the compiler doesn't get confused. So we're saying it's a vec of box of din render. So we can't have a vec of render. That's the point here, because render is a trait, so we don't know the size of things that are render. Um, but we do know the size of something that's like a pointer to uh, something that's render. Um, and previously, the previous example we, we looked at, we had a reference to something that, that implemented a trait. Here we've got a box of something that implements a trait. Um, but for our purposes here, it's, it works out the same. It's just that here, this makes sense. If you've got a vec of things, you want to own, in this case at least, you're wanting to own these shapes by pushing them into this vec. So box expresses the fact that we own these things, which which are uh, which implement render. So box is like a pointer to those things, but it owns them. Um, so it's exactly what we want here. We want to be we want a, a vector of shapes that we own, but they might be different shapes. So we say, well, it's a vector box of din render. And then when we put um, the circle into the vec, what we're putting in is not just a circle, but a box containing a circle. And when we put the rectangle in, same thing. Now we've got exactly what we want, which is a vec of things which all implement render. And we can loop through them by doing for each and, and call the paint method on each of them. And even though this is a box, this shape thing here is a box of din render we can call the paint method on it because the box of din render implements render. So it knows how to find that method. And it's using that V table to find that paint method, um, which is why it's a bit slower than if we were, if we knew everything was a circle, we could have a vec of circle. We wouldn't have to do all that indirection of figuring out where the paint method is. We'd know at compile time, we'd know it was a vec of circle. So we know exactly where in the code circle colon colon paint the method lives. And there we go. So, um, uh, yeah, like I said, there's some cost to that. There's a point in direction. It can be harder to debug because you don't know the exact type of the thing. Um, uh, you lose the type information. You no longer know that this is a circle. It could be a circle. It could be a rectangle. Um, but one of the key limitations and the hard thing to get your head around is that you can't do this for all traits. Uh, in order to make this work, and we'll see why in the next video, the traits you're using need to be object safe. Um, and we'll explain what object safe means and why you need it. And it kind of like, it's undeniable when you think about it um, carefully enough that only certain types of trait or certain method, traits with certain methods and stuff like that could possibly work in this situation where you don't know the concrete type of the thing. Um, and we'll get into exactly what those rules are about how a trait can be object safe in the next video. But yeah, take a moment to process this stuff. If this is the first time you've thought about this stuff, um, it takes a bit of getting into a bit of um, slow thinking. So give yourself time to process. Watch the video again if you need to. Watch someone else's video. And see you next time.